Welcome. Welcome to UC San Diego. Welcome to Eleanor Roosevelt College. Welcome to the inaugural lecture of the series, The Making of the Modern World, To Be Human. The Making of the Modern World is a signature course sequence of Eleanor Roosevelt College. Every undergraduate who completes the requirements for graduation at, U at Eleanor Roosevelt College goes through the MMW sequence. It covers world history from the dawn of time until the contemporary age. It is comparative, contextual, and interdisciplinary. Completing the sequence for undergraduates is a rite of passage. Before they begin, in the beginning, at the start of their freshman year, they're anxious with trepidation. About the middle, it's a five-quarter sequence. About quarter two or three, they're no longer anxious, they're just exhausted. <laughs> the rigors of the program are severe. By the end of it, they are proud. They're proud of their accomplishments, proud that they've finished, proud that they've succeeded. They're proud in what they have learned, the new knowledge, the new ideas, the new understanding made possible by this sequence. The lecture series that you're for the, uh, here for the beginning of tonight is our effort to share some of the riches, the treasure of the making of the modern world with members of the UC San Diego and the larger San Diego community. We are delighted to have you here. We had, Steve Cassidy, my co-organizer and I, we had no idea that it would be this uh, well responded to the series. We have now about 275 people in the room. We have a waiting list of about 100 people per lecture. Every lecture is sold out. Consider yourselves lucky. We consider ourselves extraordinarily fortunate to have you here wanting to share in this experience. I do, however, I do want to reassure you. I, I said that MMW is rigorous. It's kind of like boot camp, <laughs> really. And what we've tried to do is to take the boot out of it and just have the camp part. <laughs> there will be no tests, no papers, no examinations, only the pure essence of the course, a series of lectures of extraordinary quality. Steve Cassidy and I have co-organized the series in a minute. He'll tell you something about it as well as introduce our speaker for this evening. Before I turn the microphone over to Steve, I did want to thank our co-organizers, folks who have helped out with uh, bringing this lecture series together and helped to make it possible. Uh, the UCSD Alumni Association, the Chancellor's Associates, and the Parent and Family Giving Organization here on campus. Each of those units has played a crucial role in making this series possible. This particular evening is also co-sponsored by the Division of Social Sciences. Margaret Schoeninger, a professor of anthropology, is a part of the division, and in honor of her contribution to the series, the Division of Social Sciences has helped to sponsor the reception, but also uh, the television coverage. And for those of you who are eager to rehear what has happened tonight, we are televising, we're recording, and we'll televise five out of the eight, uh, five out of the nine talks. Uh, they'll appear probably about a month after the original um, lecture is given, but there will be opportunities to revisit and to relearn and to share with other people. So Steve Cassidy, co-organizer of this series, is a professor of Slavic and comparative literature. He's also an associate dean of the <laughs> graduate studies. He was from 2001 until 2007 the director of the making of the modern world. That is, he was the academic who was responsible for ensuring the direction and continuity and purpose of this extraordinary lecture series. Tonight, he serves as our moderator. Steve. Thank you so much. I just can't believe the crowd I'm looking at. We're in talks with the San Diego Chargers to get Qualcomm Stadium <laughs> next year. I just can't stand to see, especially my Osher friends, turned away from the door. So the series, how did the idea come about? I did an imaginary survey of a group of imaginary people and gathered imaginary responses and tallied those responses. Now, the imaginary people were, uh, formed a very representative group. They were of various ethnicities, educational levels, social and economic strata, ages, 
two different genders. <laughs> and the question I put to each of them was not, who are you? Because what kind of an answer does that give? A name, an address? I said, what are you? Now, the imaginary answers differed, of course, from imaginary respondent to imaginary respondent. And many imaginary respondents gave several imaginary answers. <laughs> the entire answer was a kind of composite, but what was interesting to me was that many answers were the, themselves composite. So some of the answers I received, I am God's creature. I am a lump of organic compounds. Oxygen, 65%, carbon, 18.5%. Hydrogen, 9.5, nitrogen, 3.3, small to trace amounts of other elements, 3.7%. I am my own separate, unique, autonomous, conscious mind. I am a brain, a network of neurons, and the electrochemical impulses that travel that network. I'm a member of my ethnic or racial group. I'm a member of my religious group. I'm a citizen of my nation, member of my family. I am a member of the human family. I am a woman. I am a man. I'm a kid. I am my free choices and natural rights. I am a being trapped in a web of historical circumstances. I am the spiritual descendant of my forebears. I am the genetic product of my forebears. I am a product of a long series of evolutionary processes. Now, some of these are very modern formulations that would have been totally inconceivable, in some cases even a century ago, in others a few centuries ago. Some are a bit older, and some are very, very old indeed. But it occurred to me, after speaking to these imaginary people, that the modern formulation of what human means is always going to be some kind of a composite, or almost always going to be some kind of a composite. And sometimes it'll include the oldest formulations that I just listed, sometimes not. But whatever it is, it will be the product of a de development that has gone on for many, many, many years. So this series will look at some of the older eras from a modern vantage point, of course at some more modern periods, including our own. It doesn't include everything in nine lectures. You might have noticed that there is not a single philosopher on the roster. It's not because we don't love philosophers. We adore philosophers. I think we're saving them up for to be human, Roman numeral two, maybe in a couple of years. But this series is a start, and we're going to begin with human origins and move on from there to five world religions covered in four lectures, biological science and its connection with the future of humanity, the humanities, that's Seth Lehrer, the dean of arts and humanities, speaking about the emergence of the modern conception of the self some four or 500 years ago, neuroscience, answering the question, what is human about the human brain? And then the challenges of history in a century just gone by that gave us first political systems that brought about the deaths of tens of millions of human beings and also the technical means to bring about the extinction of the entire species. Well, an answer to the question, what does it mean to be human, often has to do with human origins, or the burgeoning science of anthropogeny, which is about human origins. And that leads me to tonight's speaker. And before I introduce her, let me just tell you the format of the lectures. The lecture will go from a little later than 7 o'clock now uh, till sometime around 8. And then we leave aside about a half an hour for questions. I will moderate the questions. Professor Schoeninger, of course, will answer them. And we'll ask audience members kindly to come up to the microphone so that everybody can hear the questions that you ask. So it's a great pleasure to have with us this evening Professor Margaret Schoeninger 
of the Department of Anthropology. She received her bachelor's degree from the University of Florida, her master's from the University of Cincinnati, and her doctorate from the University of Michigan. She has occupied positions in the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department at UCLA, Department of Cell Biology and Anatomy at the Med School of Johns Hopkins University, and the Anthropology Departments of Harvard University and the University of Wisconsin. She is one of three co-directors of CARTA, that stands for UCSD's Center for Academic Research and Training in Anthropogeny. It's a brand new research unit here. Her major focus for a number of years now has been the evolution of the human diet and the role that the human diet has played in the evolution of the human species. Tonight she'll be speaking on how food fueled human origins. Please join me in welcoming Professor Margaret Schimminger. Well, I want to begin by thanking all of you again. I want to thank uh, Steve and Alan. Thank you very much for inviting me and for introducing me. I'd also like to take just a second to welcome the anthropology alums who are here. There were several who signed up to come, and I hope they got a seat, but I'm really pleased. I'd also like to welcome my colleagues and a former colleague uh, for coming and uh, some of the students who are here. And uh, so I'll begin and should finish at 8 o'clock. <laughs> so uh, if you were to ask me what we are or what I am, it's an eating machine. And I can eat anything because I can eat food directly that I can digest and that I can ferment. But I can also eat animals that eat things I can't eat, like grass. And he there are human groups who go almost fully from the part of carnivory all the way to herbivory. And so basically what I see as humans is how did we get this way? And that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight. So to begin, what we first have to talk about are the dietary transitions that I will be mentioning in this lecture. Um, I want you to know that I am not going to be talking about individual foods so often, as I'll be talking about the things that we need in order to grow, the things we need to be able to reach sexual maturity, and the things we need to be able to raise our children once we have children. So I'll be talking about fat and carbohydrates as energy sources, and I'll be talking about protein as the necessary component that we need in order to build and rebuild our tissues. Why change a diet? It's risky unless you have another human being that tells you that this is edible, that it's not toxic, that it's okay to eat. Most animals, including ourselves, are very hesitant to change our diets. And so there were dietary changes throughout our evolutionary history that have resulted in what our species is, and that's one of the things that we have to ask. I'm going to be call talking about the ancestral humans versus the ancestral apes. As at one point, we had a common ancestry with an ancestral ape, not with the living apes, but with an ancestral ape-like creature. So I'm going to be talking about that. Why did our lineage do one thing, move away from the other? How did we separate? I think food had a lot to do with it. I am going to be talking about our genus Homo uh, with the, versus the Australopithecines. There were other species before us, Homo sapiens, and I will be talking about that a little bit. I will be talking about the very early species. I put Homo erectus down there. <laughs> There are some people who think that Homo erectus was a Homo sapien, so just bear with me a little bit. I'm going to be talking about moving north out of Africa and across the globe. Once you move out of Africa, there are very different foods available, and you've got temperate climates and cold climates, and so you have highly seasonal environments that you don't have in our place of origin. I'll be talking about agriculture and very shortly about the impact of agriculture on us. And I will end with a little bit on the industrialization of food processing. And I hope I can take you through this merry, merry route. Okay, just to give just an overview. So here we are. This is our 
living primates. These are not our ancestors. And I think it's hard for people to realize, my students have difficulty realizing that this living lemur is not ancestral to us. So what was alive way back almost 80 million years ago was a primate-like thing, but it's not like anything alive today. And it's the same for all of these divisions. So once we separated from the old world, from the African apes, that was not a living gorilla or a living chimpanzee that was our ancestor. It was something, and we don't really know quite what, that was ancestral to both of us. So... I want to go across some living primates to get some general themes that I think we can use when we start to talk about human diet or our, the diet of our lineage. And the main one I want to talk about is there is quite an association between body size and diet. So let's think about what our body size is when I go through some of these things. Um, there is also a difference in terms of how they get energy. Many primates get their energy from fructose, which is the fruit sugar, and they get it from fat. We get it a lot from other things, but I'll tell you. Protein, some primates to get most of their protein from animals. Some of them get it from plants. Most of them get it from plants. So here, an insect eater. Energy is coming from fat. Protein is coming from animal food. That they're very small, and they have to be small, because to survive on insects, you either have to eat an awful lot of insects or you've got to be very tiny. And so that is exactly what they did. There are other groups of primates that actually get their energy from fruit, the fructose, and some of them actually get a lot of their protein from insects, and many of them are New World monkeys, and they tend to be sort of medium-sized. If you're going to grow big, like this chimpanzee, if you're going to grow big, you have to have something that's more ubiquitous in your environment. And so what many, most of these animals have done is they get their protein from leaves, and just like us, there are microbiota in their hindgut, their colon, and that microbiota helps them break down some of the cell walls, and then they can actually get something out of some of the things that are composed or closed in by cell walls. So they go up to about 100 kilograms. To be an exception, you have to do something. It either has to be an anatomical or a behavioral specialization. And I just want to go through a couple of them so you get an idea. This is actually another lemur, but it's too big to be an insect eater. But it is. It is the woodpecker of Madagascar. And how does it do it? It has these huge ears that are bigger than any of our ears. It can hear insects just the way that woodpeckers can hear. And it's got a very highly adapted finger that allows it to tap and then go after insects underneath wood. This is a Duke Langer. It is too small to be a leaf eater, yet it survives totally almost on leaves. If you look at that stomach there, that is not a pregnancy. The first time I ever saw these, I thought, oh, my God, all of them are pregnant. And then I realized, no, it was the hindgut. And what this did was actually do a gene duplication, which allows it to maintain more microbiota in order to be able to do that. If you're really big like a gorilla, then there's a lot of leaves in that diet, and they don't move very much. They don't run around, and they don't socialize very much either. So where are we? Okay, if we just look across the apes, this is the orangutan, and that is in Asia, so that split occurred a long time ago. The gorilla and pan, chimpanzee, are our closest living relatives from Africa, and the closest is considered to be the chimpanzee. So let's think about it in terms of diet. If you look at pan and homo, we have relatively low fiber diets, and I'm not talking about the fiber you're supposed to take from the USRDA. I'm talking about a lot of fiber that you cannot yourself digest because you do not have the enzymes to do it. You have to maintain microbiota. So we have a relatively low fiber diet, as does the chimpanzee. Activity levels are high, and we're highly social, as is the chimpanzee. The big guys over here, Pongo is also big, they eat high fiber diet. Pongo is a fruit eater, but it eats very fibrous fruits, and they just don't move very much. And they don't socialize very much. This is a gorilla feeding. Now, uh, this is a mom, this is her baby, and I want you to take a look at what they're eating. You could not eat this stuff. 
And chimpanzees don't do very well on it either. If they're forced, they can actually do it. Now, they're together, but they're not really socializing together, and so it limits what you can do in terms of socialization because you're either eating it or you're trying to break it down. Now, this is the generally accepted view of human evolution, that somehow we went through these phases, and then we ended up where we are now, striding. But I think that our expectations of what the ancestor is depends on the living ones, and we don't even realize that we're doing that. So we're going through a monkey-like phase. We're going through a knuckle-walking phase. We sort of get a little bit better at walking on two feet. We get a little bit better walking on two feet. And then all of a sudden, <clears throat> we're walking on two feet, and at the end, we're actually striding. So basically, we have been looking for an ancestor that looks like it's using the trees. So these would have been using the trees. These would have been using trees. And they would have been knuckle-walking. Well, then along came this guy. <clears throat> Excuse me, at 4.5 million years ago in Ethiopia, and it is an upright walker, and it is very close to the split between chimpanzees, uh, gorillas, and ourselves. And this just bl blew everything out of the water. She does use trees because she's got a, a grasping foot, and she does use trees she's got a hand. But that is a very different animal than what we were looking for. So I would say this is not the last common ancestor. At least right now, this is as good an option as the knuckle walker. And that means there had to be differences in diet and adaptation. So what to eat? Well, it depends on your environment. So let's look a little bit at what the environment really was. And I'm going to take you on a little bit of a tour. I hope you don't mind just spending a little bit of time on this because this is actually what I do a lot of. But um, I'm going to be talking to you about some stable isotope cycles. And in part, I decided to do that because so much of it is related to UC and to UC San Diego. And I want to go over that just a little bit. We know that most, that all plants take up CO2 from the atmosphere and they go through photosynthetic pathways and they fix um, the materials that they need. Well, that was found, the first pathway was found by a UC San Diego professor and SIO, Andrew Benson. There was another pathway discovered later. So these are two different pathways by two Australians, Hatch and Slack. So we have two photosynthetic pathways. And what I want you to notice is these are leaves. This is grass. This down here can be a C4 grass. So if you're eating leaves or grass, maybe you'd be looking differently. So how do we get to the isotopes? Well, that was Samuel Epstein, who was my scientific grandfather, who was at Caltech. And what he did is he had been collecting, as a geochemist, had been collecting plants, samples all over the world. And lo and behold, he found that there were two, they were bimodally distributed in terms of isotopes, and they were photosynthetic pathways. So you can actually use the photosynthetic pathway and the, the carbon isotopes to be able to tell what a creature is eating. That was carried to fruition by Michael De Niro, who was my postdoc advisor in Earth and Space Sciences at <laughs> University of California, San, uh, Los Angeles. What he showed is that the animals really do track it. And so you can tell whether an animal is a grazer or a browser. You can tell this is a, a grazer eating grass and this is a browser. So the last piece of the puzzle came from Nicholas Vandermerwe, who's in Cape Town. What he showed is that a C3 plant, even though it's got the photosynthetic pathway of C3, actually has a different carbon isotope value. So what you can do is if you take an animal, look at its tooth enamel, or you, for that matter, and I'll show you some human data, what would affect humans. If you look at a tooth enamel, if the animal is living in a, a treed environment, it is going to have one value. If it's living in an open environment, like where we looked at in Ethiopia, it's going to have a different value. And then, of course, there's the C4. So I wanted to see if primates do it, because if you notice, the animals I just showed you are specialized feeders, right? We're not. Primates are not. So beginning in 1997, I started a project looking at primate hair to see if I could find primates that actually track this. And what I did is look at a closed canopy forest. Those are tropical, and they do, they're not deciduous. And so they have a closed canopy all the time. I looked at a savanna woodland. A savanna woodland is a place with trees, fair number of trees, but it's got grass underneath. 
That means that if you're a primate and big, you have to come to the ground and walk and be exposed to predators all over the place. The other thing I looked at are gallery forests. These are forests that run along rivers, and although this is farmland here, a lot of East Africa where um, Artipithecus was found are, have exactly this kind of setup. This. So I looked at primates. I looked at the little leppy lemur, a cute little guy sticking his head out the, the tree there, which is a prosimian. I looked at an old world monkey, and I looked at new world monkeys, and lo and behold, they do track. So it's not the type of food they're eating. They actually track what kind of ecology they're in. So if I were to give numbers, I can estimate numbers based on the hair values. Then my colleague here, an emeritus now, Jim Moore and I, looked at chimpanzees and looked at chimpanzees from all these environments. He collected the hairs. Those are chimpanzee nests up there. He climbed up those trees. Thank goodness, <laughs> I did not. And he actually um, took the hairs that I then analyzed. And chimpanzees track it too. So even though they're big and they walk around a lot, they track. So let's go back here to what we think was going on with Artipithecus. And I'll just detail the data for you. There's Artipithecus. And Artipithecus is in a, a more open environment. They are not in a closed canopy. When it's reconstructed, it looks like this. It's either a savanna woodland, which has a lot of open area, or it's a gallery forest where there's a lot of open area beyond the forest. That means that part of what our ancestor is was eating something in that kind of environment. So what was it eating? Then I'm not going to give you any numbers here, but, um, well, except for these. <laughs> so we know, what do we know about diet? The carbon isn't going to tell us diet because you can get a, the diet signal from a lot of things in carbon. But in nitrogen, you can. Now, there's no nitrogen in a fossil, but what we can do is look at what animals, primates, eat in various environments. And if it's diagnostic in primates, large primates, we were large. If we we're a large primate in that area, what would they have eaten? Well, if you go to plants, just any plant, you, if you have soil nitrogen, it's a little larger than zero. The plant is going to be at least three numbers higher than that. If you look at the animals that eat, they are three numbers higher than the plant they eat. Now, there's another play, way to get air nitrogen, which is from the air, and those are leguminous, bean plants. And lo and behold, chimpanzees in open environments eat beans. That's where the protein's coming from. They have to eat the pods green because they don't have very heavy teeth. Their teeth have very thin tooth enamel, and so they have to eat something that's soft. So what about Artipithecus? Well, Artipithecus was in an area like that, and I think they probably ate both the soft ones and the hard ones, because their tooth enamel is far thicker than a chimpanzee's. It's almost as thick as ours. Let me go back one. So what I would say about Artipithecus is that this is a marginal area for chimpanzees today. They don't like being there. If there are any predators around, they run very fast to the next tree. And so our ancestor, I believe, lost out in the competition with ancestral apes. We were pushed into marginal environments, and what we did is move into that environment and find a source of both fat and a source of protein through seeds, and they're grinding them with these teeth. So we can just generalize here that what basically what Ramatus did, Artipithecus Ramatus, is pretty much the same thing for all um, Australopithecines. Big, whomping molars, in fact, by the time you get up here, those molars are about three to four so times the size of a human molar. That's the back teeth. They're huge. And then the enamel is just really, really thick. So when we look at our early homo ancestors, they don't have that. They have thinner enamel. It's not as thick as ours, or it's thicker than ours, but it's not all that thick. So what do they do? What are they doing that allows them to get away with eating something different than what the Australopithecines did? And this time, I don't think we lost out. This time, I think we actually <clears throat> won the, 
the competition. If we look at all australopithecines, the skeletons where you have postcrania, all of them have conical rib cages. Well, okay, what's a conical rib cage mean? It means you have a huge gut. It means you are doing a lot of hindgut fermentation. You're, you have to have a lot of microbial populations in your hindgut. So that's limiting what you can do, just the same way it limits what a gorilla can do. Homo habilis, on the other hand, does not look like that. It's pretty fragmentary, but it does not look as if it has a really huge hindgut. Now, but they have had tools. Tools help you prepare stuff. You can pound things with tools. And this is actually a little Cebus monkey. It's about that size. And it's picking up an un, just a piece of rock and trying to break a, to, a, a seed with it. Now, if a Cebus monkey can do it, I know they've got a big brain for body size, but if a Cebus monkey can do it and chimpanzees can do it, I think our ancestors did it too. So I don't think this is any. But what is amazing about the time that Homo habilis appears is that you get sharp cutting tools. You get tools that are flakes, and those flakes can be used to take part of meat off a carcass. We also have, at the same period, or really close to the same period, we have a cut mark on an antelope bone 2.4 million years ago. What some animal, and I think it was our ancestor, actually cut the tendon off the foot of an antelope and took the meat off. To do that means you're getting there quick. So that means there has to be meat on the carcass. Something else has not taken that carcass. And that's not just they're going to grab and cut and they're going to run away because they're not that big yet. Now, this is one of the possibilities of thought for the early Homo erectus. And there are lots of disagreements with this particular scenario. <laughs> Were we born to run? <laughs> but I will say that early, if to do that, you have to have a huge amount of energy and protein. And the other thing about this guy is that he's big. He's our body size. Males and females are equivalent in body size. So just body size alone is going to take a lot of food. And if this individual ran, which I'm not fully convinced we're born to run, but if we were, that ups the energy requirement even more. So, and, and the protein requirement, because you're growing a larger body. It's the first time females are as big as they are. And so to get a female that big, you have to have a lot of energy and a lot of protein. Well, lo and behold, what we find at the time of the early Homo erectus are these tools. They're called Oshelian hand axes, and they have a very sharp edge on them. And my graduate students can tell me that you can take an animal apart really easily with this and that you can actually cut into skin, take a bone off, take part of an animal off, and run away. So you can do a quick butcher, get the meat, and run away. The other thing about this is that males and females are roughly the same body size. We know based on other primates that with the same body size, there often is investment of both parents in the offspring. And being as big as they are, the babies are born with brains not very well developed. So someone took care of the babies. And what do you feed a baby that is not nursing all the time? You can't feed it the same kind of thing that an australopithecine ate. They don't have a big enough gut to hold that much food. So you can't feed them that. But what you can feed them is the fat from the marrow from an animal. And what you can feed them is give them a little bit of meat. And, of course, many of you are going to be nursing, too. The women are going to be nursing. But now we have a weanling of food that a baby can eat and grow and, and grow well. So I think what happened with Homo habilis is they got us started eating a lot of meat protein and fat, which is different from most primates where most of the energy comes from fructose, a sugar. <clears throat> they got us started. But with Homo erectus, I think it really was well developed. But there was, prob there was hunting going on. There was close, close access to carcasses. But let's look at what happens a little bit later than that. 
we spread across the globe. Actually, Homo erectus spread across the globe. So what do we do to spread across the globe? That means you have to change diet. As you move north out of Africa, you're going to move into an area in which the plants are not recognizable. And there aren't going to be any other primates there for you to look at to see what a primate can eat. Because if you could see what another primate ate, maybe you could eat it too. But you're moving north, you're not going to be able to do that. The botanists tell me that the, one of the plants that actually transfers and that an animal can know to eat are the seed heads of grasses. Now, of course, the problem here is that we have tiny teeth and we don't end up getting a lot of grasses and we'd have to chew them. So what do you think we did? If we also moved out of Africa, we had to be warm, and so we had fire. And what fire does for you, if you can cook, is it actually breaks your food down for you. It also detoxifies some food for you. So what you can do by cooking something is you can expand what it is you can eat, and you can also cook the heck out of these and make yourself a porridge and eat it. And so you could actually eat something that normally you would not be able to eat. These things are going to be available only seasonally. So what are you going to be able to eat the rest of the time? Well, you can always eat an animal. We're made of meat. They're made of meat. You can always eat an animal. And so if you went north to an area in which during the cold time of year there is nothing growing, you can actually eat an animal if you're good at, it, at hunting it. So I think one of the things we are pretty sure of, by about 0.8 million years ago, we are we are pretty sure we have fire and probably controlled use of fire. So that led us to the next stage. And I'm skipping over a lot of years here, but if the next major stage, I think, in dietary change for our lineage had to do with agriculture. Agriculture gave us a staple. Agriculture allowed us to store things. We settled down. They allowed us to store things over the period of time when food is not available other than animals. It allowed us to build houses. Some of the early ones are square, so what you do is build sideways and up. You can grow your population. So agriculture did a lot for us. And we have these staples in the Fertile Crescent. We have wheats and barley, China millet and rice, Mesoamerica corn, which is maize, and in South America, there was also an independent development of potatoes. These are independent of each other. There may be more independent developments of agriculture, but these were independent of one another. They all have something in common, though, and that is that starch is now, it's a carbohydrate, starch is now the main energy source. And <clears throat> depending on how it's processed, some of those starch, starchy grains actually contain protein. So we have really changed our diet completely from fat and protein from animals to starch and some animal product. Now, we are set up to do that. You yourself have amylase in your mouth, which allows you to start digesting starch. It then gets into your stomach. Thank you. It then gets into your stomach. Excuse me. Good. <laughs> I was thinking too much about food here. My salivary enzymes were not working very well at all. <laughs> Amylase dried up. So as, it, as you swallow and it goes into your stomach, the pancreas also produces amylase. There are um, cells producing amylase in your pancreas that ends up in your stomach, and you then can digest starch. And it looks as if humans have selected for that fairly recently to be able to do that extremely efficiently. But it's a very different type of energy source. Now, what about into our continent? Because if you notice here, I'm talking about the South American highlands at less than 10,000 years ago. But we think people came to North and South America 15,000 years ago. What were they doing and how did they get here? Now, the common thought is that there were three sequential migrations. This has been based on linguistics, it's been based on morphology of living Native Americans. Three sub, uh, sequential migrations, somewhere between 10 and 15,000 years ago, that they came through the um, Siberian land bridge, they went north, that they walked through, 
that they came into Central North America where they had very large hunting spears and they hunted big game. And then there was a drought and people were forced out to the coast. So it was kind of a second choice. People did not go west of the Rockies until they had to. Now, all of those are from northeast Mongolia. All of those, pop, all of those uh, sequential migrations, what you see in the record later are what look very much like mo we would call them modern Amerindians, and they are today's Native Americans. And it is true that if you do the genetics of modern-day Amer American Indians, they are relatively similar to one another. But there's been another proposal, and this one has been quite controversial, but I think we did some testing here that actually helps us. And that is <clears throat> that there were two sequential migrations, not three. These were probably a lot of sub-migrations, small populations moving in, that there was an early one that came from the southern Pacific Rim or South Asia, and that they became what we would call Baja Amerindians, and they died out. Or if they did give any of their genes to the modern population, it was minimal. And it's not too surprising, since it's probably small populations, populations died out all the time. There's been a problem, and what's really been supporting this more recent hypothesis is that <clears throat> the early people, those that are between 15,000 years and 7,000 years, actually, they don't look like modern Native Americans. They look like the Ainu of Japan, which is a population in the northern part of Japan. And the idea is that some of these must have come from South Asia or from the southern Pacific Rim, became the Amerindians. There was subsequent migration from Northeast Asia, and those are from Mongolia, or Mongolia. They are the modern Native Americans. Now, <clears throat> another thing we have to realize is that if they did this, this is a coastal route is what's being suggested, and they had to have boats. And in the beginning, no one wanted to believe that the early peoples here had boats. And now we know that people got to Australia about 60,000 years ago and it changed the whole sphere of time. People must have had boats. And here, if they're on the coast, maybe they had seaworthy boats because if they got here from Southeast Asia, they didn't go across the Bering Lands. They went up and around, but along the coast. Well, we have some materials here um, nearby in La Jolla that we thought might be able to answer that question. Were these people eating marine foods, in which case and that was different than was seen in the modern Native Americans who were here when the Spanish came? They did take seafood, but they, ate a, they would go seasonally with seafood. So what we have is the Chancellor's House has a site on it. And it was excavated multiple times, 1936, 48, 56, UCSD purchased it, and then in 1976, another excavation was done, and this is what was found. This is a double burial, one of virtually the only one that has ever been discovered. The other interesting thing is one of them is on one side, facing one way. The other one is on the other side. <clears throat> there is one individual who's male and one that's female. The male is at her feet. They were put in together, they were put in with no burial items at the same time. Is that not incredible? I mean, you have to have some kind of really developed idea of what you want to do for a ceremony like that, to be able to put people in like that. So what happened is back in the early days, 1976, this was carbon-14 dated at 9,440. That's older than Kennewick, just to give you a sense of where we are. It's one of the earliest in North America. Um, there were two other sites in La Jolla that were also done, and one of them is also relatively early, and one is a little bit later. And some of those were run by Beta Analytic. Now, what a man at um, the Smithsonian, Dr. Douglas Owsley, did is look at the morphology. They don't look like modern Native Americans. They look like those others that may have come from North South Asia. What Pat Masters, who was at SIO here, is now retired, 
actually wanted to do diet reconstruction. So she sent samples to my lab. I was then at Harvard. She ran and asked my graduate student to run the samples, and he happily did without telling me that he was doing it. But we ended up with a lot of data, which Pat then told me about when I moved here (laughs) because I didn't know any of this. (laughs) So she asked me. She got the data in the late 1980s and couldn't get it published because no one would believe the data that anything could be in California, a human, that old. It was not believed. So they just said, oh, well, um, until we get some more information, and the way you're doing the dietary reconstruction is new anyway, and so we're not sure we're going to allow you to publish. So that she could not publish it. So we still have the data, and we're going to publish What I did for my postdoc with Michael De Niro is demonstrate that if you look at nitrogen in any kind of organic, not only can you tell if the animal is eating another plant, you can tell if an animal is eating another animal, and you can tell that an animal is eating marine food and eating terrestrial food. It's a beautiful distribution. So let me just run you through this a little bit. These are Georgia inland foragers, way down at the bottom. They're inland, no marine food. This is Pecos Pueblo, agriculturalist, no marine food. If you look at the coastal agriculturalists on the east coast, they're eating at very, very low trophic levels, and they tend not to be terribly elevated in nitrogen. But if you look at the Santa Barbara Channel Islands and things, people who were analyzed there, we're starting to get a lot of marine food and diet, a little less on the coastal sites, but it, it drops off as you move inland. That was work done by <clears throat> former, a now deceased colleague at UC Santa Barbara, Phil Walker. These are our data. This is the Chancellor's House site. They look like Eskimo. What are they eating? They're eating marine foods year round. These were not people who were seasonal on the coast. These were people who were on the coast year-round. And Phil Walker always said, we have no idea of the complexity of what the social systems were like 10,000 and 15,000 years ago, because by the time we, Spanish, landed here, they were doing something very different here. So they are eating marine food all year-round, and it's this kind of marine food. We're talking about deep sea fish, we're talking about marine mammals. Now, they could bonk some of these on the head at a rookery, right? You know, they're raising their babies, you just go up and hit them on the head. But you're going to have trouble doing that with either a dolphin or a big tuna. So they had to have seaworthy boats. They're out on San Nicolas Island. You have to have a seaworthy boat to get out to San Nicolas Island. And they must have had sophisticated fishing equipment, which we did not see when the Spanish landed, and they had to have some kind of hunting tools for those. Now, one of the new graduate students at UCSD tells me that he had been excavating in Baja at one of the early sites, and he's seeing fish hooks. And so it's a very different adaptation than what the Spanish saw. Well, it looks now, and it's not just my data, but data from other people, that there had to be some migration along the coast. That would have allowed them to get to South America as fast as they did. There are actually people that have been pulled out of sites in Brazil that look just like the, one, the old ones here. So it looks like they were, had spread across. So a very different scenario than coming in the middle of the country and then being pushed out to the coast. They chose the coast. They had a lot of food there. Now, just I'll finish up in the last few minutes with industrial processing and what it has done to us. Now, when we started with our starch dependence, we were grinding, but grinding with a mortar and pestle. And when you grind with a mortar and pestle, you can winnow it, and you can get rid of the real chaff, But you're going to, first of all, be eating a lot of grit. Where's your teeth down? But the other thing is you're going to be eating the whole grain, the whole grain. Now, that was replaced by draft animals and water till about 1880. And when you're doing it that way, either way, it's a stone grinder, and it's not red mill stone ground wheat. It was really stone ground wheat, and it also had grit in it, and it was the total grain. 
So what you did was get the protein in the grain, you got a lot of complex carbohydrate, including fiber, and then you got starch. But in 1880, we developed steel rollers. And what steel rollers do, they squeeze the protein out, the endosperm, they get rid of any of the coating, and that's your white flour. And that is all starch. And it is a very high glycemic index, meaning that if you eat white bread, your glucose level goes up almost immediately. So that's part of the reason for the emphasis on trying to go back to whole grains is to get away from this problem. Starch is so easily digested that if all you do is eat starch, you just, you're, you're almost in glucose overload for a while. Let's look at another carbohydrate, sugar. Now, honey and maple syrup would have been the only sugars available until about 500 B.C., because those are the only natural sweets. There may be some other odd ones, but really, it, it was only in 500 B.C. did we get crystalline sugar. Now, that is not a fructose. It's sucrose. It's your table sugar. But earlier, you didn't have sugar year-round. Once you have crystalline sugar, you can eat it year-round. And we know we have a taste for sugary things. This is a baboon at one of my colleagues' sites, Shirley Strum in Kenya, and I was taking my, uh, one of my students. And this is the baboon eating a cactus fruit that is virtually all sugar. And they eat them for energy, and it's, as long as they have other things to eat, it's fine for them. So that's our primate ancestor. These people, the Hadza in Kenya, uh, Tanzania, would not have been able to do that. This is a picture taken by one of my students at Wisconsin. If you see how much energy they're exerting, and they're not only getting it seasonally because they only have honey in the hive seasonally. Look at the sugar consumption in the United States. This is total sugar consumption, 1909 to, to between 1990 and 1999. We have almost doubled our sugar intake per capita per year. Per person per year. And then the next thing, the evil <laughs> in the room. In the late 1970s, ion exclusion chromatography could actually separate out high fructose corn syrup at a very cheap rate. And they could take it from cornstarch, which nothing else wanted. And so what they did is make a high fructose corn syrup, and that is a fructose and a glucose two sugars together. If you look at that consumption in the United States, this is 1970, this is sucrose, this is glucose, this is high fructose corn syrup. So virtually all of the sugar intake, or at least more than half of it, is in the form of high fructose corn syrup. And that is a, it's, it's a, it's a sneak Devil, <laughs> put it that way, because it's in almost everything you eat that's processed. If you were to go get any breads, you get a little hint of a sweet, some of that is high fructose corn syrup. It makes things taste better, preserves them better. So if you process your own food, you're not going to get it, but virtually all processed food has it. What else do we have? We actually have fairly cheap ways of producing animals these days. We call them factory farms, and they're pretty disgusting for the animals. And if you drive west out of here, you see some of them for cattle, and it'll make you put you off eating it for a very long time. And if you go into Iowa, you're going to see pig farms that are pretty much the same way. So what we have are very fatty meats now. Salamis are good ways of preserving meat, but it's 74% fat, 77% in bacon, hot dogs, 82%, fat, pork ribs, 72%. T-bone steak, 68%. That's a lot of energy <laughs> for people who don't move around very much. In fact, let's look at this. If you want to see about high fructose corn syrup that's in the bun or anything else, because of stable isotopes, you can actually tell whether your animals are corn-fed, which is going to put a lot of fat into them. They're not meant to be eating corn. They're meant to be eating grass. They've got big, big ruminant stomachs to be able to allow them to eat grass. If you then analyze that, you can tell which ones are grass-fed. 
And Burger King actually has some that are grass-fed. But McDonald's is almost all corn-based, and Wendy's is all, virtually all corn-based. So what they're doing is getting very cheap meat, and that's very fatty meat. It tastes good. They're adding salt. And in the bun, they got a little high fructose corn syrup, and that's why you can actually get your day's worth of calories with one Big Mac. So next time. So where are we now with human evolution? <laughs> so as you know, we have an obesity epidemic in this country and in many other countries. Now, it has, seems to have stabilized um, about 19, 2003, it seems to have stabilized, no more increases, but we have a lot of people who are overweight and therefore have health risks. Now, I'm not going to go into the food politics of it, but I will t tell you that we're set up to eat really fatty, high sugar foods with some protein, and then you get advertising in and add it to it, you get drink machines everywhere. We don't have them at UCSD. UC San Diego doesn't have that many. And to try to get a candy bar, go off campus. <laughs> You're going to have trouble finding it because they don't have it. So at least UC San Diego is trying to give us somewhat of a healthy diet. But with the sugar, with this kind of advertising, we're eating more and more. And we have to be careful. And it's going to be our choice. We're at a point where it's going to be our choice what we eat and what we give to our children. And I'll end there.